let us start with local sensitivity. A local sensitivity analysis will try to determine how sensitive a model output, so the variable y, will be to changes in one or more of the model parameters theta, and this in a single point in the parameter space. So it will fix a point in the parameter space, it will fix a number of values for your parameter theta, and then it will see what happens or how sensitive is the output y if these values for theta are fixed. Mathematically, this will correspond to taking a partial derivative of your variable to the parameter. So you take delta y delta theta, the partial derivative of the output y, with respect to the parameter theta that you are looking at. You know from mathematics that such a derivative corresponds to the tangent of the function in a certain point. Then you also know that the larger the absolute value will be of this derivative, the steeper the slope of the tangent will be, and thus also the more change there will happen in a small interval. So the more the value of y will change over a small interval, the bigger the influence of the parameter will be on your outcome. Since we are looking at dynamical models, we will have y values which are varying over time, and so also my sensitivity will be varying over time. So we will not have a sensitivity as a single point, but we will obtain a sensitivity function. This sensitivity function is denoted by capital S, so S of t, S at time point t, is the derivative of y with respect to the parameter theta, but evaluated in the time point t. Since our model will contain multiple parameters, we will then calculate also multiple sensitivity functions, so one sensitivity function per parameter theta j. Very often, y of t will only be able to determine numerically, so we will not have a function rule, but we only have the observed values for the outcome. Since y of t does not have a function rule, and we can only determine it numerically, so also s of t will only be able to determine it numerically. To then determine the sensitivity, we will make use of a finite difference method. So this is very similar to the limit definition of a derivative. But now my sensitivity is a function which will depend on the time t, but also on the parameter that I am looking at. And we will be varying the parameter. So in our limit, we will make a difference between theta j plus delta theta j, so theta j with a small step forward, and the function in theta j itself, and then we divide by this difference delta theta j, where this difference will be small and going to zero. This method is called the forward difference. The reason it is called a forward difference is because we are looking forward. So we have, on the one hand, the observation for y in t and theta j, and then we look at what happens if we increase theta j with a small step delta theta j. So we look at this point t theta j, and then we look forward to t theta j plus delta theta j. In order to find this forward difference, we just have to calculate two functions. So we have to find y t theta j, the one in dark blue, and also y t theta j plus delta theta j, the one in light blue. If we have calculated both functions, we can then determine the sensitivity function using a forward difference. This function will then tell you how sensitive my output y is in theta j, so for the parameter theta j, for different values of the time point t. This sensitivity, because it is defined as a derivative, will be proportional to the steepness of the curve of y, and we also can see that here, the highest peak, this peak, corresponds to the part in the function where the function is the steepest. The perturbation delta theta j is usually defined as being xi times theta j, so it will be a factor times theta j. This factor, this xi, is called the perturbation factor. The question then will be, what value will we choose for this perturbation factor? So what value of xi will we be using? to determine this forward difference or to determine the sensitivity function. So we have to define, one way or another, an optimal choice for this perturbation factor. How small or how large do we take xi? Of course, we cannot take xi too large, since then we are no longer working locally. 
and in that case, the forward difference, which is a linear approximation of the sensitivity function, is no longer a good approximation. Trivially, the larger your perturbation will be, the bigger the difference between your true function and the linear approximation will be. On the other hand, Xi cannot be too small either, because then we run into calculation problems because of the precision of your computer. Another option to approximate the sensitivity function is through a backward difference. So instead of looking what happens if we take a step forward, we can also do the inverse. So what happens if we take a step delta j backwards? And then we look at the difference between t theta j and t theta j minus delta theta j. So we will always assume that the perturbation delta j is positive, And so we subtract delta j from theta j. And then finally, we could also use a central difference. A central difference is the average of the forward and the backward difference. So it is y evaluated in theta j plus delta theta j, minus y evaluated in theta j minus delta theta j, and then you divide by two times the perturbation, since now the difference between the first and the second component is equal to two times delta theta j. To calculate a central difference, we also need to calculate two functions, two function evaluations, one times with theta plus the perturbation, one times with theta minus the perturbation, but never the function yt theta j itself. With these two functions, we can then make the central difference again, and this central difference can also be an approximation for the sensitivity function. As we already mentioned before, for a nonlinear model in the parameter, such a linear approximation is only value for small perturbations. This is because such a finite difference is only a linear approximation, and so the farther away you go from the point that you are looking at, the bigger the difference will be between your linear approximation and the curve itself. The perturbation can also not be too small, because small perturbations can give rise to numerical errors because of the computer precision. And then the good choice for the perturbation factor, usually we will look for a perturbation factor in such a way that the forward and the backward difference will give us the same result. So this could be seen sort of as the left and the right derivative being equal. To simplify, we will introduce some notation. So the forward difference we will note as delta y delta theta j plus. The backward difference we will write as minus and then if we do not specify anything, we will use or we will say that it is the central difference. And then we want that the forward difference and the backward difference, they should be identical when choosing our perturbation factor. However, clearly, your forward and your backward difference are both functions of time. So in order to be able to choose your perturbation factor, we need to introduce a single number, a criterion that we can compare. If we define the deviation at a point at time point tk as being the difference between your forward and your backward difference, so rk is the forward difference evaluated in tk minus the backward difference evaluated in tk, then of course we would like that this rk is equal to zero, of course if it's possible, when choosing the optimal value of xi. However, it will never be possible to get a zero for every time point. So by choosing one single xi value, you will never be able to set every rk equal to zero. However, we want to minimize as many deviations as possible. So we will introduce a number of criteria which will help us determine the optimal value of xi. For this, we will assume that we have n discrete time points. So this is the most common case. You have observations in n discrete time points available that you will use to calculate your criterion. The first criterion could be the sum of squared errors, SSE. For this criterion, you take the squared deviations and then you take the average of all those squared deviations. So you take the sum over all time points of RK squared and you divide by n the number of time points. A second option is not looking at the squares of the deviations, but the absolute value of the deviations. You take the sum of the absolute values and you divide by n. This gives you the sum of absolute errors. Both of these are absolute criteria. Since we want that each deviation is zero or as close to zero as possible, 
both the SSE and the SAE should be as small as possible, as close to zero as possible when choosing Xi. And then one final remark for these criteria. You see that we either use the absolute value of the deviation or the square of the deviation. The reason for this is that we want to minimize the deviation between the forward and the backward difference. But we don't care if this deviation is positive or negative. We just want to have it as small as possible. But the sign is unimportant, so we will ignore the sign by taking the square or by taking the absolute value. And then two other criteria are the maximum relative error or the ratio of positive and negative perturbed sensitivity functions. These criteria are relative criteria because they use fractions. For the maximum relative error, MRE, you divide the deviation RK by the positive difference. And then you look at the maximum value of this fraction and you try to minimize this maximal value. For the other one, you take 1 minus the forward divided by the backward difference. Again, you look at the maximal value over all time points that you obtain this way. And then you try to minimize this maximal value by choosing Xi in a proper way. For the maximum relative error, you know that the deviation RK is a forward difference minus the backward difference. You then divide by the forward difference. Or... This is 1 minus the backward difference divided by the forward difference. When choosing Xi, you want that the forward and the backward difference are equal to each other, and so their division should be equal to 1. 1 minus 1 would give us 0, so what we are aiming for when determining Xi is to find a value of MRE as close to 0 as possible. If you find or if you make this value as close to 0 as possible, then you also know that every other relative error will be smaller, because here we are looking at the maximum relative error and we try to make this as small as possible. For the other one, the ratio of the positive and negative perturbed sensitivity functions, the reasoning is the same. If you look at the formula, you see that this is almost the same as for MRE. The only difference now is that you have 1 minus the forward divided by the backward difference. But again, if both of them should be equal, then this ratio is 1. 1 minus 1 would become 0. And so you will determine Xi in such a way that this absolute value will be as close to 0 as possible. If we make this maximal value as close to 0 as possible, then we know that all the others will be even closer to 0. So by choosing Xi in such a way that this is as close to 0 as possible, we make sure that all the deviations are as small as possible. The advantage of these relative criteria is that they also hold or can be used for continuous time frames. So instead of n discrete time points, if we have a continuous interval of time points, we can still use these two uh, formula, these two criteria. Whereas the previous two are impossible to be used because we cannot take a sum over an infinite number of points. So in that case, the criteria should be updated, they should be modified, and one way to do so is using integrals instead of sums. On this slide you see the function of three criteria, SSE, SAE and MRE, and this for different values of the perturbation factor. And then what we have to do is choose a perturbation factor that makes the criterion as small as possible. We clearly see that the functions they have different values, so each criterion will give us different outcomes, which is logical because they are defined in different ways. But globally, the shapes are very similar. So the two absolute criteria, SSE and SAE, they have the same shape. And then the two relative criteria, MRE and the ratio, they will also have very similar shapes. In this example, the optimal value for Xi for the perturbation factor would be 10 to the power minus 4 because this value minimizes the criteria. The optimal perturbation factor can be different for each combination of the model output y and the model parameter theta j. And so this becomes a very intensive task, especially if your model is very complex or if there are a lot of parameters. The choice of the perturbation parameter will also influence the sensitivity function. On this slide, you see two sensitivity functions. Sensitivity functions of my outcome with respect to a parameter DOK1. So they are both 
for the river example that we will discuss more in detail later. But we have chosen different values for Xi. In blue is the true sensitivity function, in green is the one calculated using a certain value of Xi, and you see that the upper one is a very smooth function, whereas the lower one is a very irregular function. So your choice of Xi can have a huge influence on your estimation of the sensitivity function. Very often, your model will have multiple outcomes and certainly multiple parameters. And so we also want to compare the sensitivities for different combinations of outputs and parameters. If we do this through the absolute sensitivity, so the sensitivity that we defined before, this absolute sensitivity will be influenced by the scale of my variable or my parameter. Think for example of a distance which is expressed in kilometers or in meters. Just because the scale is different, even though the distance will be the same, there will be a difference in my sensitivity by a factor 1000. So to get rid of this influence of the scale, we will use relative sensitivities. To get a relative sensitivity with respect to the parameter, we multiply the sensitivity function with the parameter theta j. This way the scale of the parameter is cancelled out and it will allow us to compare sensitivities of the same variable, so of y, with respect to different parameters theta1, theta2 and so on. If we take the sensitivity function and we multiply it 1 over yi, so we have different outcomes, y1 up to yn, let's say, then if we do this, we can or we obtain the relative sensitivity with respect to the variable yi. Now we have cancelled out the scale of the output yi, and this relative sensitivity will allow us to compare the sensitivity of different variables, so different yi, but for the same parameter theta. And then we can also calculate a total relative sensitivity. In that case, we take the sensitivity function, we multiply with theta j and we divide by yi. This way we cancel out the scale of both the parameter and the variable, and this will allow us to compare all sensitivities. So this sensitivity is relative with respect to the parameter and to the variable. Such relative sensitivities will allow us to rank the sensitivities. So we can see, because we got rid of the scale, which one is more sensitive than which other one. It will help us to allow choosing parameters in parameter estimation. It can help us choosing parameters for model reduction. And it can help us to determine where or when to take additional measurements in order, for example, to reduce sources of uncertainty. Since such a ranking will depend on the nominal value of the parameter, the parameter theta j is in the formula after all, this ranking can be different at different positions in the parameter space. So depending on where we are looking, the ranking of the parameters can change. The problem still remains that the sensitivity functions are continuous functions. And so how can we compare continuous functions? To do so, we will focus on specific time points, namely those time points where measurements are available or will be collected. Suppose now that we have a generic model with v outputs, so y1 up to yv different outputs of the model, p parameters theta1 up to theta p, and we take measurements at n different time points. For each combination of output parameter n time point, we can calculate the total relative sensitivity. So the total relative sensitivity for output yi, parameter theta j, and time point tk is the partial derivative of yi to theta j, evaluated in the moment tk, and then multiplied with theta j and divided by yi. To determine how important a parameter is, we have to look at the influence of this parameter on every possible output yi. We will thus make a combination of the sensitivity function over all the variables. So we take a sum and an average over all variables. And again here the sign is not important. So we are interested in how sensitive it is, but not if it is a positive or a negative sensitivity. So that's why we take a square and a root. If we do this, 
we obtain the root mean square sensitivity for parameter theta j. To calculate this root mean square sensitivity, we just take sijk, so the sensitivity for the combination yi theta j tk, we square it, because the sign is not important, only the size, then we take a sum and we divide by v, so we take actually the average of the squares over all the different output variables, and then we take a root out of it, just to bring it back to the original scale. At this moment, we have combined the impact on the variables, so we have delta rmsq with subscript j and k, which still depends on the parameter theta j, but also on the time point tk. This value can be very different from moment to moment, and so we will also take a sum and an average over all the time points. To calculate this time mean root square sensitivity for parameter theta j, we take all the delta rmsq jk and we average them out. So we take the sum over all time points and we divide by n. This gives us now a single value, which is independent from the variable and independent from the time, and so we can compare this for the different parameters theta j. So we now obtain a single measure for the sensitivity of a parameter, and we can use this to determine the importance of the parameter. The value we obtained depends on the nominal parameter value, for nonlinear models, we will obtain different values at different locations in the parameter space. We will illustrate this on the next slide, and this will also come back in global sensitivity analysis. Furthermore, the value will also depend on the choice of the time points. A different choice of time points can give different values for the total relative sensitivity. If the total relative sensitivity changes, then also the means will change, and so the time mean root mean square sensitivity for the parameter will change. Let us now illustrate the impact of the choice of the nominal value of the parameter through a very simple example. Suppose we have on the one hand a linear function in A, so A, the parameter A, is theta in the previous models. So we have a linear function y is equal to ax plus b, and on the other hand, we have a nonlinear function y is a squared x plus b. To simplify things and to be able to make visualizations, to make plots, assume that x is equal to 1 and b is equal to 0. So the functions we are considering are on the one hand y equal to a, the left plot, and y equal to a squared, the right plot. Recall that the sensitivity was the partial derivative, so it is the slope of the tangent line. In the left plot for the linear function, this slope is the same for every value of the parameter theta, so the parameter a, and so it does not change over the different values. On the right, you see that if my a increases, then also my slope increases. So for the right one, the nonlinear case, the slope and thus also the sensitivity will be determined by the value of the parameter a.